Disaster ahead. You're on a bridge. Underneath of the bridge is a train track. It appears there's a train barreling ahead, and in front of the train is disaster. If the train continues on its current course, there are five workers who cannot see or hear the train approaching. It appears, for whatever reason, they are unable to get out of the way of the train. They will most certainly die if something does not happen. You have access to a lever. And if you pull that lever, you have the ability to move the train from instead of going straight ahead, to make it veer to the left. And if it veers to the left, there is one worker on that portion of the track, and one person will die. So, if you pull the lever, one person dies. If you don't pull the lever and do nothing, five people die. What should you do? This is an introduction to ethics. Today, it's deontology versus consequentialism. Whenever we get into ethics, we're going to ask, what is ethics? It's the moral principles that govern a person or group's behavior. That's the dictionary definition. What it really means is moral being concerned with the principles of right and wrong. The things uh, great people uh, over the last several millennia have asked people in ancient, ancient Greece, um, and of course certainly something our religions tackle as well. What we're going to be doing is a more secular, uh, non-religious ethical questions today. Uh, begin by asking ourselves, how should we behave? What should we do in certain circumstances? And what criteria should we use to make those decisions? On your right, you'll see a gentleman by the name of Immanuel Kant. And on the left, you'll see a gentleman by the name of John Stuart Mill. Both of these individuals had very different answers to these questions. The big debate is, of course, deontology versus consequentialism. You're going to need to take notes because there's going to be some uh, very uh, heady, weighty issues and some definitions and some language that may be slightly confusing. Fortunately, we'll try and keep it as simple as possible. And when we tackle something like deontology, we're going to examine first the meaning, which is from the Greek, which is the nature of duty and obligation. Simplified, an ethical system based on adhering to rules. Whether or not something is right or wrong depends on if it follows or breaks a certain rule. So when we ask ourselves, is stealing wrong? Uh, deontology will say if, if there is a rule that says you should not steal, then it is wrong. If there is no rule against it, then it's okay. Um, there's certainly more complex nuanced understandings of this, and that's where we come into Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant is typically the person people reference, or philosophers reference, when we're talking about deontology. Uh, he was born in Germany uh, from the period of 1724 to 1804. Uh, came up with a lot of very important uh, philosophical ideas. Specifically, when we talk about Immanuel Kant, we're talking about the categorical imperative. So when we say does something break a rule? Is, the, is there an injunction against us doing something that makes it immoral or uh, moral? We have a general idea here, a general prescription, that then tells us basically all of the possible uh, things that we can or cannot do, just judging by a simple quote. Immanuel Kant wrote this in Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals. The quote is, act only according to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law without contradiction. Now, certainly that sounds very complicated, and it is. If you simplify it, it becomes quite a bit easier by just looking at three words. The first word is maxim. When we're talking about a maxim, we're talking about a short uh, rule for conduct, how we should behave. 
And Immanuel Kant is essentially saying, you can figure out all of the natural universal laws or rules about whether something is a proper thing to do or an improper thing to do, immoral or moral, simply based upon asking yourself, could I make this a universal law? Would it be acceptable? So you need to behave as though you are constantly asking yourself, would it be acceptable for everyone to behave as I am? Would it be acceptable for me to steal if everyone was allowed to steal? Would it be acceptable for X, Y, or Z? It's a general uh, prescription that then allows us to create every natural uh, rule that we can think of. Kant is telling us constantly, if we were in a certain situation, the situation does not change whether or not it's an immoral duty or a moral duty to behave a certain way. Something is either right or wrong or it is not, and that goes from the outset. We could call this normative ethics, something being um, precisely good or precisely bad, and whether or not there has been a, a natural disaster, whether or not the natural disaster threatens our lives, whether or not the natural disaster um, has put a store in our nearby neighborhood and that store has food that could potentially save people's lives, that doesn't matter in this prescription. We're simply asking ourselves in a theoretical world, when we do something, could we reverse that something we're doing and make it a universal law? So is looting acceptable? Well, it wouldn't be acceptable to make a universal law that says looting is permissible. Um, would it be permissible to steal something? Well, no, because if we're allowed to steal something, then when Kant says it is a, needs to be universal, it would therefore be okay for anyone to take uh, all of my um, belongings, all of my capital, etc. And the end result would, of course, be um, an anarchist uh, society, anarchist society, and we would have really very little um, constructive going on. So he says, from the outset, there are all these rules, and if we just simply uh, apply this prescription, we can uh, find out the answer to basically any question we want to know that's ethical. Right or wrong, simply follow this prescription and we know. There are natural rules, and Kant says don't break them. Whatever you do, don't break them, because that would be an immoral action. And this leads us to a problem, and this is where philosophy gets uh, interesting, is that it leads us to engaging debates, interesting discussions, and the first problem we have is a moral absolutism problem. That is, even if you think you have a good reason to break the rule, like I said, there could be a circumstance that makes it, in your opinion, or um, in your judgment, a good thing under that circumstance to lie or steal. Under this condition that Immanuel, Immanuel Kant gives us, it's still wrong to do so. It's always wrong, no matter the circumstances. So decision time. Immanuel Kant, standing there beside us, we're on the bridge. Can we pull the lever and volitionally kill one person? Because when we pull that lever, we are essentially killing someone. Um, it, at present course, we can do nothing um, and people will die. If we pull the lever, we've essentially made a decision to uh, kill a person, which of course, as we know, is a, is a very terrible thing. So what do we do? Now, I'm not going to make that decision for you, uh, and that's why philosophy is so important. But Get off of the trolley for a second. Get off of the bridge and start asking yourself real questions. Many philosophers attack the categorical comparative because of its absolutism. Um, you can think of an obvious natural rule, something like thou shalt not lie. Uh, then you can construct a situational argument 
that it would be permissible to break that rule and violate what Kant, uh, Kant is telling us. Now, don't use the trolley problem. Uh, it's already out there. People have already debated it, and there's been books written on it. There's been uh, countless uh, thousands of hours spent debating that particular problem. Try using something more realistic, uh, historical. In what historical circumstances would it be acceptable to break Kant's categorical imperative and do something that we from the outset think is um, an impermissible thing or an immoral thing or an unethical thing? In what circumstance would it be okay to lie? In what circumstance would it be okay to steal? Um, certainly, we don't think these are permissible things, but perhaps in a certain situation, obviously, uh, wars happen, and in war, um, things are different. In genocide situations, things are different. In what circumstances would it be acceptable to violate the categorical imperative, construct an argument against the categorical imperative, describing why, situationally, things change, and why, in certain circumstances, certain outcomes are more preferable than others. It's certainly preferable that a lie occurs than a death occurs. We would rather lying happen than people die. So that's a really heady, weighty task. Um, it would make a great uh, paper, something that could take up uh, several pages and could really um, cause you to think. You can get more information on the categorical imperative, uh, deontology, all of this simply by uh, utilizing Google, and it will point you to most universities' uh, philosophy department web pages, and they'll have a lot more to say than certainly I do at this point. And of course, most of these texts are uh, open source because uh, they're not copyrighted anymore, and they're available um, all over the web. Now, if you want a translation, um, that'll be relatively inexpensive, and you can find those um, quite freely. In the next lesson, We'll look at someone who specifically tackled the arguments against deontology, who said that, in fact, if we were in the trolley situation, perhaps the moral thing to do would be to pull the lever volitionally, actively, killing one individual and saving four lives. So we'll tackle that in lesson two. But for now, think about this task. And really give it some weight, and also think about the other normative moral codes that are similar to Kant that perhaps would break down in certain circumstances. Hope you enjoy this lesson. Thank you.